thanks a lot for the invitation uh, of being here. It's uh, quite exciting and also I have to admit my first time in Dublin, so that's also uh, interesting to be here. Um, and thanks, Hannah, for this kickoff because uh, actually my practice is hoping to bring your kind of practice forward. Uh, and on the table. So I am uh, part of, of an architectural platform, which will a, I will explain a little bit uh, in, in some slides that are brought. So uh, bear with me, it's going in in all different directions. It's, it's a bit of a, a fast overflow of, uh, of some years of, of practice. Um, since I'm the second speaker, I, I dared uh, to start with this one because I thought uh, that might be floating around a lot and I thought, uh, well, I'm the second one, so I can do it. Um, the practice of uh, Marcus Mise, who uh, wrote this uh, actually in total three books about um, the nightmare of participation. Did someone say participate? Uh, which tackles and, and talks about, I think, a lot of, of the same things uh, that Hannah has been talking about, like what is this nitty-gritty uh, part of, of participation which makes it not so obvious. And, and uh, I, I think you, you touched on, on a lot of uh, those things that he has been dealing with too. So I've been thinking about this, this invitation, of course, and the title, the Beyond Participation. So if you want to think beyond, then you must have some doubts also about what do you actually reach with participation and why is this such a buzzword. Um, the second word is beyond, so beyond participation. And for me, that was quite interesting because we make this magazine, it's called Volume, and it has a tagline. It had, I have to say, a tagline. Uh, for 50 issues. This is the 50th, and as you maybe can see, the beyond is kind of dripping off the cover. Uh, the tagline was, uh, to beyond or not to be. Uh, we have that in, in the spine of, of every issue of volume since it, its existence in 2005. So the notion of beyond was, was for us extremely important in the sense of going beyond uh, our own practice, going beyond architecture, but also going beyond magazine making. Uh, so we called Archis Volume uh, a cultural platform to debate, research, rethink and reinvent our environment. Uh, we do that in, in the form of a network. Uh, this looks a bit strange because uh, we are very big in the middle and, and we are not so big. We are a very small organization. Uh, so the, the size is only um, uh, the indication of uh, the, the, met the, the, the amount or how do you say that? this? Um, the bigness of the, the cooperation or the collaboration in, in time and, and, in, uh, and we are very busy with ourselves, so we are very big. Um, so we are a network organization. We always collaborate and we need to collaborate. It's, it's in our genes because we are dealing with things that we are too small to tackle and, and we also are not capable because we don't have all the cap capabilities of, th of the network around us. And we are dealing with themes and issues that are so diverse and so big that we need the expertise of others and, uh, and tap into them. Going back to some of this history, uh, we, we trace back uh, from 1929, so that is really long. Uh, when there was a small magazine in Holland called, uh, at that time, the Catholic building magazine. Uh, so this is already stages much later than we had Wonen, which is housing, and the other one, I will all skip this, but uh, th this is pointing as, as some history in Dutch magazine making that always has been from its very roots uh, coming from a kind of uh, a position of uh, looking at the social part of it, of architecture, let's very simply put it like that. 
Uh, this is the period of, of Argis, so when all these name changes has transformed the magazine into Argis, this is almost the point when, when I entered it uh, in, the, in the 90s to join it and when it was already an international magazine. So we, uh, we changed uh, language to English and, uh, and looked at, at the world at large. And we're rethinking um, and, and looking critical at uh, architecture as a profession and as a practice, uh, but also as at ourselves as a magazine. Like, what is a magazine? What, what do we want to be and, and what can we do? Um, and since we were deeding and there we slowly, this word participation is coming in, uh, we... we actually like to participate with our audience, with our readers, and that is fake. Of course, it's totally fake because you are a magazine and we are the editors and we are deciding and we are putting what we want to put. But still, we had this idea of kind of wanting to be the Internet or something and wanting to engage with our readers and wanting to have the feedback of our readers. And we did this with, uh, with content, but also with the help of, uh, help of our designers. Uh, who created this perforation in the magazine, where we did all kind of experiments with magazine making. Perforation means tear out, that means the, the possibility to take out the page and do something with it. Uh, like for instance, uh, having the page and then asking people to send them back to us, creating a ballot, creating a uh, a voting paper, creating a poster which you would uh, hang on the window, uh, putting in our, our, we had our mobile phone numbers in the issue of hoping people to, to phone back. Did they do it? No. Did they <laughs> see a lot of posters hanging? No. So it, it is a gimmick, but it was a general interest and it was really like, how are we getting out in this world and how are we actually going to create this debate and not solely having this monologue all the time. And we did this, uh, I'll skip this one, come back to it, with uh, inventing events. We called them the RSVP events. Uh, responde s'il vous plaît. Uh, so please respond to us. So we did a call, which was like we are going to Kabul uh, in fall 2007. We will talk about security. Uh, because we think it's important to talk about it in that space. Well, in this case, it's not so difficult to think why. Um, and it is a call for action and a call for, for people to join us. So they would uh, inscribe, they would get back to us via email, and uh, we would form uh, the whole event according to the response of the people. So we would create it uh, in a thousand different ways. So if there would be only one person responding, we would have a dinner party with that one person. If it would be 10, then it would be an expert meeting. If it would be 2,000, then it might be a flash mob. So it was completely depending on, on the amount of people, but also the, the, the sort of interest and the sort of background of those people. And that was also because we wanted this dialogue and the discussion, but also because we uh, wanted this real cross-disciplinarity. We wanted to have conversations with people around a theme, and we were fully aware of some themes being tackled by uh, or tackled, but <laughs> being discussed by architectural design world, by uh, maybe geographers, maybe sociologists, maybe artists. So people from all different fields. But if you organize something like a conference, like something like this, you will have the same kind of people. They will know, okay, this is organized by the Architectural Foundation. These and these speakers are coming. They're using these terms. So we would understand each other. And I can imagine you all coming from the same kind of background and you will know a lot of people and you will all... So we engage with each other. And that is what we have been talking, of course, all of us, I think, a lot, that you always talk to each other. And how do you engage with other kind of people and we thought it might be it might work if we try it like this so we only announce a theme and ask people like how do you engage with the theme and why do you want to discuss it so uh, we did a lot of them um, in in different places all over the world and and they differed wildly from 
you see some from there to there. So there were trips, uh, two, three days with 15 to, to 25 people. Uh, we did some, just one conference. We did a lecture. We did some tours in, in the streets. Uh, we did the topic of shrink, for instance. This is New York, as you can see. Uh, shrink in New York, and that was, we announced shrink, but it ended up through the response of the people with a nanobiologist uh, talking about uh, the shrink to the max, uh, nanobiology, and this whole um, uh, technologies, how, the, how you can play them out in, in, uh, in, in the city, uh, how you can, uh, can use them. Uh, we talked here, this, this position is from the, um, uh, the Statue of Liberty, and we talked about shrinking minds, and how at that point in time in New York, people were feeling, they didn't know what was still to come, of course, but <laughs> and, and at that point already, they were thinking there were some minds were shrinking, and there was some politically really danger in, in how the city was being ruled. Uh, as you can see, we, we asked people to bring their favorite uh, building in, uh, in model uh, shrunken versions. Um, this was the discussion at the Statue of Liberty. So we uh, did this effort, this was paranoia, we did that uh, at, uh, at the, the wall in Israel, between Israel and Palestine. Um, and actually, this was a quite quite important event for uh, for us because it was in um, in Palestine, and it uh, it was successful. And that what actually we underestimated that if you do a system like this, and this communication work, if you are successful in having an informal meeting where you do engage people and where you really work together and where you really create this group then it's a bit strange of go in there and move out and go to your next event so maybe if it's successful and there is a kind of community and you are talking to each other then maybe you have to stay a little bit longer and that is actually what we now uh, envision like we do it we don't know the outcome and it's totally unpredictable but if something can grow from it, we are, uh, let's say, uh, prepared to stay. And I will come back to some uh, uh, of those events, uh, let's call it getting out of hand, <laughs> and, uh, and they are still with us. Um, getting back to volume as, as a project, um, because that's what we call it, it's a project uh, by Archis, which was us, the first magazine, and we were looking beyond ourselves, uh, the magazine. AMO is, is, let's call it the daughter of uh, OMA, the Office of Rem Kohlhaas in Rotterdam. Uh, they are the think tank of, of their office and they want to think beyond the architectural office, like what is that kind of research behind it. And C-Lab, that is the, the uh, they called it uh, the Laboratory for Broadcasting Architecture of Columbia University in New York, uh, founded by Mark Weekly, and they were really engaging in how to broadcast architecture, so how to go beyond the school. So we were beyond the magazine, beyond the office, and beyond the school, trying to, to find ways to, to deal with our profession in different ways. These are some of the issues we made. Uh, they are uh, 51 by now. And as I said, this, this 50 was for us a point where we made a shift in this thinking beyond and, and leaving behind this, this tagline. Because the thinking beyond means also a kind of... Um, if you look beyond, then, then you are inclined also to skip things. You, you, you go beyond it and, and you don't focus on it. And we thought this is a time that's, that is dangerous not to, to look deep. You also need to dig deep. I know after me uh, there will be some deep digging by, by forensic architecture. I think they are a very, very good example of having this, this almost geology uh, looking in, in deep, in, in, in specialization and really in detail looking at an issue, 
in for which you need specialization. But at the same time, we need to keep an eye on the big picture. So you need the helicopter and at the same time, the drilling in the ground. And, and that kind of combination um, you can also only create by having specialization, but also having a network of all those specialists who create this overview. So that is actually what what we kind of aim for, for our next, uh, I don't know, so many years of uh, existence. Um, volume 14, this is unsolicited architecture, which was quite, I, I, I take it out because it was a pivotal issue for us. Uh, the OUA portfolio inside means uh, the Office for Unsolicited Architecture, uh, which was fake, but... Um, Again, we, we make fake stuff a lot. Uh, unsolicited architecture that was done in 2006. We created this issue, 2007 maybe, uh, the point where we thought uh, maybe it's time for architects and architecture to to act as, uh, as Hannah just described maybe, uh, going out yourself and not waiting for your client to, to, for, to ring, but to start acting yourself. That is a kind of practice that, of course, uh, over the, the crisis, uh, the financial crisis, uh, happened because of need. But that that was the financial reasons. Uh, but there might be also, I'm sure, there are also other reasons to do that. And it fundamentally changes your idea of an office. Because if you go uh, beyond that, um, that idea of, of the architects and, and waiting for your client to ring, that means that you are your own client, that you have your, to raise your own finance. Uh, so you maybe the office would suddenly need a lawyer. Maybe you need a sociologist in your office. Maybe you need an economist in your office. So it's, it's a completely other way of thinking uh, than, than just your, your architectural profession. Uh, and it might lead to, to projects like this, uh, where you draw a line and, and you have a soccer field or uh, in this case a basketball field. Um, project getting out of hand. So thi this is one of them. Uh, we went to Beirut uh, directly after uh, this was asked for. We had contacts uh, in Beirut. Uh, the war happened, the last war in 2006, where Hezbollah and Israel were fighting um, and, and destroying not only uh, the south of Lebanon almost in total, but uh, also a large part of the city of Beirut and then mostly uh, the Hezbollah area. Um, people we know there, they, they invited us and say, please come with, with an event, do something, because we as very young uh, architectural community, art community, we are stuck. We, we are so devastated by this happening, and we feel all the time our city is being destructed, and we want to do something, we need to do something, but we are kind of paralyzed. We don't know what to do, and maybe you just, with foreign eyes, have it might help in, in creating something. So I think that was basically the only thing we could bring is foreign eyes because for the rest, who are we to, to be able to, to act in a situation like that? But it, it kind of created, so, so this was the situation uh, and only in some parts. Uh, this is a bit uh, strange uh, uh, because of <laughs> going from that to the party. But it's, it's also... Uh, Beirut, uh, in, in which you have this strange contrast, but it's um, it l led uh, the whole project of, of uh, 10 days, uh, led to this, and this was actually the start of Studio Beirut. So we kind of founded Studio Beirut after this RSVP event, um, and they uh, have this space, this, this is their, their home, and they create workshops uh, with uh, uh, local people from the city, with architects, with artists. They create debates. They, they kind of 
have their energy back and bring energy to, to their city. They were uh, doing a lot of things in public space. They, they were the first uh, tagging all kind of buildings and, and places in, in the city, which uh, before that uh, didn't even happen. We are still working with them. We, we created this issue of, of volume afterwards, cities and build. Uh, we created uh, with them, they created, let's say, a, a guide for us as an organization. It was the first in a series of travel guides, and we call them the Never Walk a Lonely Planet Guides, um, which are alternative travel guides to cities. So they are made with people who live there, uh, people who are coming in and out, so they are made with people who are from there but not living in the country anymore, but coming back and therefore seeing it differently than if you just stay there. And with foreign eyes, so let's say our eyes who are like, what is happening here? And also those eyes tell something about your city. All those stories, which can be history, which can be drawings, which like this, um, they kind of form a guide which you can actually use. You can walk around with the guide, but also you can read it at home or, or in the airplane and, and get a feeling of, of let's say, the soul of, the, of that city. Um, getting out of hand, it even got more out of hand, and that's all connected to Beirut still, uh, but o not only Beirut. It was also the event uh, in Kabul, the event in Kosovo, led us to this project, which is, uh, I think, one of our main projects. Uh, I, I would call it that way. Maybe my colleague would say otherwise, but for me, it's, it's dear to my heart. Um, architecture of Peace counters the idea of the only existence of architectural war, the fact that we have an architectural war we are all familiar with. Uh, but can you materialize peace? Can you imagine a role of architecture in, in creating peace? Which is uh, a hard one, but um, that's why, why it takes so long uh, that we're thinking about it. Um, we created also, again, issues. Uh, this is uh, the first one. Uh, this is the second one. That's why we call it Reloaded. Um, and we created an exhibition. And it all comes from this. And imagine the difference between this and this. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the difference, but we call this war, and we call this peace. And maybe you see the flag, maybe. But it looks exactly the same, and basically it is exactly the same. So what is the difference between this war situation and this, uh, this uh, peacekeeping situation? Uh, that is only that the UN came in, and they are there. They're probably there for the next uh, 20, 30, 60, 100 years. Um, and on the ground, for the people who live there, the situation is basically the same as this one. Um, the the field of, of political studies, they call this negative peace, which is also a very strange word, like what is negative peace? Uh, that means that negative peace is the situation when you go out of that situation, war starts immediately, directly after UN uh, peacekeeping left, you start again. And that is because... Um, there is no positive peace. There is no uh, no finishing, real finishing to the war, to the war. Um, so, this everlasting situation of uh, of negative peace uh, and and the enormous amount of time it takes before it might get into this other stage, might architecture, might our discipline uh, uh, play a role there and almost also the other way around. Why are we not? Why, as an architectural community, don't we feel responsible to act in a situation where building in all forms of um, matters of the world, uh, building community, building, building, building city, building infrastructure, is, is the thing that needs to be done? And we are not there. We don't seem to feel responsible. We don't teach it in schools. It's nothing in, in universities. Uh, weird. 
But it's also the other way around. We are also not asked. There is no who is dealing with it. It's the military, it's the NGOs, and it's politicians. The three parties, they are negotiating this negative peace phase, phase and really working hard. It's not, I'm not blaming anyone because it's, they're working really hard to get to this stage. Uh, that's why we thought maybe if these more spatial disciplines is being brought to the table, maybe it will uh, will just change the, the angle of thinking. Uh, so the exhibition is, is a traveling one. It is uh, created uh, to influence. The whole project is actually uh, directed towards those two sides, towards us, architectural community, like maybe get more involved. Uh, and also have some tools because it's not an easy situation to work in. And the other way around is, hey, politicians, policy makers, maybe uh, we are here, maybe we can bring something to the table, invite us. Um, this was the first installment. It was uh, uh, at the CCA in, in Canada. We it traveled in, in Germany to Munich. It traveled uh, to uh, Rwanda, to a place that we hopefully see later on when Killian is presenting. Um, uh, to the Netherlands, to Germany, well, uh, different countries uh, in Europe. Um, this is, uh, there are case studies in the exhibition of th uh, projects that we think that work, that actually do create this architecture of peace. And one of them is this park, it's done in Kabul, it's, it's our kind of the project that we think is the most uh, successful, ticking all the boxes. Uh, and you would think like a park in Kabul of this totally ruined city. Uh, yes, uh, why? Because it is dealing with every detail that it needs to be dealing with, and that is with creating employment. So they employed all the different um, uh, communities around that park to helping making it. The park is also the, the tomb of um, um, Bash Babur, so that's the name of the park also. And Babur is, is the founder of Afghanistan. Uh, so if you kind of uh, renovate his tomb and make a more like honor to, to the tomb of, of Babur, you also give back some identity, you give back some proud to, to, uh, to a population that doesn't have much left of that. Uh, they created a safe haven for actually those families and, to, and the women to be there. Um, so they created a kind of environment in, in which you could, could live together and find some community. And this is, I can assure you, still is the only place in Kabul where you can do that. Uh, they also uh, uh, engineered a system that goes too far to really go into this, but I think it's really important for the continuation of the project. So it is paying itself uh, in, in terms of maintenance now. And it's, it's continuously providing employment for, for the population. From this exhibition, we created some what we call factors for success. And it is uh, uh, things that, that could work uh, and that you have to take into account if you work in, in difficult situations like that. Uh, it's, they are not fixed. We are still working on them and changing them all the time. Sometimes when we, we present them or we, we in-depth talk to them by now with students because we are teaching uh, Architecture of Peace now at uh, a master studio at, uh, in Belgium at the KU Leuven. Um, they say, but yeah, but this is actually what every architect has to take into account. It's not just in, in, in war situation. And, and I completely agree with that. Uh, totally true. It, uh, it should. Um, Total change and, and wrapping up, uh, because this is a, a next project we are uh, embarking in, uh, Trust in the Blockchain Society, and that's another lack of, of kind of lack what we see, and that is uh, architecture and technology, and they somehow also don't match. There is a, a kind of, again, a gap between them. Uh, architects think technology is something 
um, maybe to distrust uh, or not to understand. So it's it's very difficult and very hard, but also it's it's kind of sleazy. You don't really deal with that. Uh, and from the other way around, uh, coders are, are totally not interested in our field and the bigger companies who are leading this technology, uh, they don't need architects. I mean, they can perfectly form the world ourselves. So we see more and more a world being created um, with the autonomous uh, trap, <laughs> they call this, um, where actually technology and, and, and the larger firms that I don't need to mention are taking over uh, a world of designing our environment and designing cities. This is a data center in Amsterdam. Uh, without us having any influence of it and and going into a domain that was previously, I think, uh, that some urban planners or, or urban designers had something to do with it. Well, we don't anymore. So I think we need to, to really radically um, um, kind of uh, coincide or no, put together architects and for the sake of the word, let's call them coders, put them together and work together on projects. And then I don't mean kind of uh, buildings that start moving or some, some uh, paramedic design. I mean really thinking about a city of the future together. And, and this is our very first issue, uh, changed in form or changed in, in design uh, beyond the beyond, uh, digging into uh, architecture and technology, architecture and work, automation, all those different fields. So um, I think that's about 40 minutes uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lillette. Uh, hugely uh, powerful. Um, as I said, I, I work in government, um, and the, the, the lie of government is that everything is certain. It, it isn't. And one of the things that we're all quite conscious of is a thing called complex adaptive systems. So you're no sooner at a point that you think you know something's sorted than the world changes. So you seem to be building an architecture to deal with change to create the, the, the city of the future. It's interesting just reflecting on your presentation around a call to action about the art of the possible, you know, so uh, from the, the war and peace kind of image, you know, what are the possibilities? Not yet realizing the physical project, but to make sure we have that curated discussion about what is possible. And, and uh, we're struck that in the war and peace kind of bit, there is an extreme imagery in, in what you've presented. But on the ground, maybe reflecting to Hannah's point, when we go into social housing estates or regeneration areas, there is a form of war and form of violence within communities and between institutions and a hopelessness sometimes, so that the extreme imagery actually is played out in very domestic, very similar things within which we need the art of the possible and the call to action. So, so really powerful. Before kind of we continue this, can we invite any questions? There was a, yeah, I think there's some huge provocations, lots of very interesting stuff. So. Any uh, questions from the audience for Lillette, please? Yourself. Uh, could you elaborate on the blockchain society and what role you see technology playing in that? Um. Yes, as, as far as I can, because we just started the project. Um, the title, uh, Trust in the Blockchain Society, is, is a kind of double, of course. I mean, uh, blockchain and trust is a big issue. Um, there are some, some hopes and beliefs uh, that blockchain might uh, open up uh, ways to change systems. Uh, financial systems, but law systems, contract systems, uh, trust systems. Um, the other way around, you could say um, you, it is fundamentally an, uh, about distrust because it is you don't need to trust anymore because it's in the blockchain. 
so we are hmm. using this this title as as a form of uh, of how to create new systems of creating our communities and our cities together in a new way. And the blockchain might be one way, uh, probably not, but. What are those new kind of systems? So in that sense, it's we are actually asking people to really dig into blockchain and really look at ways of how to to find tools of design and create it in in a different way. And we are still really interested in that. But we hope and and no, not hope. We uh, assume that something completely different will come out of that, but uh, apart from, from the blockchain. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that like trust and distrust is a factor in that. So like, if, if you're operating on the assumption that something could come out of this, like I'm presuming that's not drawn out of thin air, so like it must be based on smaller examples that have taken place before. So do you have any examples of like pieces of blockchain that would have worked in another context? just to refer to yeah it, it kind of worked of course in in the, in the financial domain and that it opened up a new kind of thinking about uh, economy and about uh, our, our whole economic system I mean it kind of broke uh, quite fundamentally uh, with with uh, all kind of cryptocurrencies of of other ways of thinking about money and about thinking of exchange and economy. So in that sense, I think it already brought a lot in a discussion at least. And and so we use it for the sake of a discussion and the, and the sake of how to open up systems. I mean. I think it goes too far, maybe we, we get into that more uh, later on, but our point now, and that's also the change on in this going beyond and, and into the digging deeper, is um, we are stuck in our systems. I mean, we can keep on bringing oil on and go on with the same economy and the same social systems and the same, but it doesn't simply work anymore. We have to to break it and, and think new things, radically new things. That is what so many people are busy with right now and, and so urgently busy with. Uh, but how to, to do that if you are so fixed in your old system? So this is a new system that needs to be explored and that needs to be uh, digged in. Okay, I mean, uh, just uh, uh, one, one thing just on the trust bit, um, the OECD have published a report on trust in public policy, which looks at trust in government, trust in media, trust in corporations, and trust in communities. And what they've found is that in the last 20 years, trust has reduced across all of it, down to an all-time low of around 41% globally. What difference does that make? It means we don't have trust in economic systems now. Uh, and it has transaction costs. We don't have trust in social systems, so you have the emergence of radical politics, weird notions of the way the world should work, and, and, and massive mistrust of people. Um, and one of the things they're saying to deal with that is not to put universal 100% trust in a system that you can't touch. So if the human, like Hannah's point, is not visible in the system, it's not trustworthy. And a good example of that is the converse of blockchain is the dark matter phenomenon. You know, so that in trading data, trading currency, in an ideal world, in a perfect system, that is perfect real data. It isn't. It is not. It is absolutely open to bias, much of it. So if we can't learn on the history point from Hannah's bit around the practice of the systems we've created, mm. we cannot be confident that the system we are about to create comes without bias, which kind of brings us back to the, the good system bit and links it back to your call to action about we cannot be invisible in the design of these new systems. Sorry, yourself. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of going on from that. It was just about your point about earlier about going beyond and maybe missing something if you go beyond participation and not fixing on it. And um, I guess I was just thinking back to when we were kind of conceiving this in 2016 or late 20, it was probably 2015 when we were talking about it for the first conference. And 
you know, when we're, you're kind of in it and you're saying, well, of, of course participation is, is the way and it's the right way of doing things and it's mm -hmm. the good system. And we were feeling a bit like, okay, so let's go beyond that. You know, let's accept that as a given yeah. and go beyond that. But I suppose I just wanted to ask now, now we, here we are in 2018, how, where do you think we are with that? Should we actually, like, are we at a point that we actually go have to go back and fix on it and, like, we're, you know, remind people that actually it's not a given? <laughs> it's not, like, you know, where are we in the room on that, I guess, globally, politically? Um, do you think that we have to kind uh, of it, it reset that? It definitely is still not a given, but, I mean... Uh, a lot have changed, of course. A lot in, in the minds of, of the profession of architects and architects has changed. I mean, the, the idea that you are just putting your, uh, your sculpture somewhere uh, still happens, and it still happens a lot, but it's, I mean, there is some changing minds and, and educational ch change of thinking that maybe the people are going to use it, live in it, uh, have some something to say on it. I had a very nice lecture by Mike Wickley just the other day, and he says the architects is the is by now the only person in in the world. Maybe he was doubting if an architect was a human. Uh, so his his project are we human? Because I thought like an architect is the only human who thinks that a building is not solid. They are thinking it's a concept and it's light and it's kind of floating or something, but every human knows that you bump into walls and that it's fixed on the ground and that we cannot get it away with and that it's there. And so there, there is something with the architect's mind which, which makes them so interesting, but at the same time so kind of sometimes uh, losing this, this idea. So <laughs> I do think, yes, we always have to keep reminding that actually uh, and, and remind ourselves that, that you're working for and with somebody. And I think still practices like HANA are still rare. Some and, and, and I think everything uh, you said is, is so fundamental and so logical also. I mean, you said I'm a very logical and practical person. And I think, yes, uh, it's, it's of course. But it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of stamina and endurance to, to work like that. Okay, very good. Any final questions before we move on to Stefan? Take yourself. <laughs> I could have come down actually. Hi, um, I just want to go back actually a little bit to the thing about systems and um, and the change, changing systems. Um, so thinking about uh, blockchain as the latest new change that's there, perhaps and. It just seems to me, I, I think about Sontag saying that out of crisis comes change, but it seems to me that the only change we ever see is a technical change or a technological change. And we f we don't see changes in our social and you know money-moving systems and our political systems that are fundamental. In fact, we see probably the opposite. We see a co-opting of those systems, or uh, sorry, a co-opting of the latest idea or the latest desire perhaps of the people by those systems. So we see feminism co-opted by the market, for instance. And I mean, I really enjoyed Hannah's reclaiming the space, but we also know, as she said, very, very many cynical uh, uh, inhabitants in that space as well. So I'm just wondering <laughs> where, from where we will see change. Obviously we see it in war, in crisis and in chaos. And then the only other place I ever see it in is a technical change, a technological change of some sort in the latter part of the 20th century, which is all I know in my lifetime, let's say. Okay. Yeah, I'm a fundamental optimist. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, I, I think partly you're right. So uh, that's the call for action. So change that, please. <laughs> and there was a question here. Um, yeah, just a really quick comment on the blockchain. Uh, if anyone wants a good example of that, there's there's a, a Dutch-Irish um, little collaboration, a coffee company called Moi, 
people working in Dublin and Amsterdam, and they're looking at using blockchain to uh, change the way that their pro whole process is recorded and, and the the um, workers who make the coffee in Ethiopia are properly paid for their goods. So it's just a really good small example of that. But just for Lila, I just wanted to ask um, the on the perforation that you mentioned earlier, the part of the magazine that you could remove. I didn't fully catch how that worked out, or did you say that, that people didn't respond to the um, the part of the magazine that you could remove and, and write comments in and send back, or how, it seemed like a good idea, and I was just wondering how successful that was. No, in, in the end, it's, it, it doesn't work, no. It, it, I mean, it is also, I'm talking about in 90s, uh, when, when we did this, and, um, I think the only time it really worked when we had so I I, I was showing the spine eh? so the spine stayed of course and the and the rest you could tear out the spine was always uh, the place where we would put the credits and the captions so there was what was on the page actually so one time we did a silly joke. But it was about tattoos and architecture tattoos, and we put in the spine uh, that it was a, a picture of Rem Kohlhaas with his tattoo of so and so, and we actually never print that page, so so we took it out. So there was just the spine was left. So th so there were all the tattoo pages of all the famous architects with tattoos. That was our series. They were taking out. It was the only time we got reactions <laughs> by people who said there were offices calling and they said that the interns took out the pages before it was ever entering on the desk of of, uh, of the other people. So that was the only provocation actually that uh, that made it. So we we tried our best, but no, people are not going to tear out pages and send them back and call. Good, Good to know. It's good to know. Okay, thank you very much, Lilet. Uh, and could I just uh, extend a round of applause of our appreciation, please? <coughs>